everyone. My name is Caroline Griffin. I am Riot's Director of Operations, and I am super excited to have you here with us today for another wonderful Lunch and Learn in partnership with Aurora Group. And today we also have the wonderful John um, here with us to give a great presentation on behalf of XGR Technologies. Just a couple quick reminders before we get started. Please do keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. There will be an opportunity for you to unmute yourself at the end of, pres of the presentation and ask any questions. Um, this presentation is being recorded, will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and the meetup group where you signed up for this event. So stay tuned for that after the presentation. If you have any questions throughout the event, please do put those in the chat box. Aperna from Aurora Group is going to help um, John get all of those questions. And we also have Bill Candy here to help answer any and all of the questions that you may have throughout the presentation. Um, but without further ado, I know you guys are here to see Aurora Group and XGR Technologies. So I will hand it over to Aperna. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you, Caroline, for the kind introduction. Uh, as Caroline mentioned, my name is Aperna Spralik. I'm with the Aurora Group. And I represent, and we represent a variety of electromechanical components and manufacturers. Today, we will be bringing you this lunch and learn session together with XGR technology on lightweight board level EMI shielding solutions. But first, a few words about the Aurora Group. Uh, the Aurora Group is a firm that's been representing supporting manufacturers for over 30 years in the Southeast. Let's get the slide going. Uh, the Aurora Group is committed to facilitating technical and component solutions for OEMs, CMs, engineers, and manufacturers. We offer technical advice and support for on quality manufactured components. We guide our customers through their technical challenges with new existing products, and we act, of course, as a component liaison uh, to the manufacturers. We offer a variety of technical components that range from electronic components, such as capacitors, transformers, motors, touchscreens, mechanical parts. Here's a quick view of our coverage on the East Coast. And here's a quick look at our team. Many of us have been in the industry for a long time. You may know some of us from some of the past in-person riot events. Bob Kirkland, Bob Ball, Ken, and myself cover the Carolinas. Bruce covers Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. Karen covers Georgia. And Kathy Hill, of course, is our inside sales manager, does a fantastic job. Many of you may already know her. Here is a quick look at the manufacturers we support. You can see XGR is highlighted right in the middle because we're going to talk about them a little bit later today. We also are really proud members of lots of organizations. Uh, we're very much connected with many organizations, associations, and trade groups in our geographic area. And we are especially proud to be a sponsor of the Riot. Carolyn and her team do a fantastic job connecting across multiple industries. And of course, we can't forget about our distributors. We have a, a lot of them and we work with all of them. Today, we'll be presenting on EMI shielding challenges. Board level EMI shielding from XGR technology is a revolutionary approach to solving many of the shortcomings of common board level shielding solutions. Here to present how Simple Sphere solves many of today's EMI shielding challenges. Presenters are John Buckwald and Bill Candy. John is uh, the VP of XGR Technologies and Bill Candy is president. Both Bill and John are formerly with WL Gore and have extensive engineering backgrounds regarding protection technologies. Bill Candy is founder of XGR Technologies in, in 2018 and was co-inventor of the Snapshot technology, which we'll talk about today. And he holds a master's degree in mechanical engineering and is a PE. John Buckwald is it really the main guy in charge of bringing the snapshot technology to the broader market. He also has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree. And we are going to learn a lot about these things today. I will put myself on mute, but I will be checking the chat box. So if there are any questions at all, 
please drop in the chat box and I'll be interrupting John throughout the presentation to get your questions answered. Here to present or to start presenting is John. All right. Thank you, Aparna, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us here. I hope this uh, discussion is informative and, uh, if nothing else, interesting. Um, as Aparna mentioned, we're going to uh, talk about how a, a, a novel use of solder spheres is uh, solving many of today's EMI shielding challenges. Taking a look at what we're going to talk about, give a little bit of background on EMC and board level shielding. Um, not familiar with, you know, what everybody that's here and what their background is. So uh, we'll just do a little overview of that. Talk through what the typical shortcomings are of uh, traditional board level shields. And then introduce uh, the technology uh, of Snapshot, which is really a combination of the materials and the use of the solder sphere. And then uh, this is sort of the, the laundry list of the shortcomings that, that we'll review and how, how the snapshot technology compares and overcomes these challenges. So with that, get into the background. I think um, it's pretty obvious. Uh, I think we're all in the electronics world here and see every day that, that devices are getting smaller and smaller. Our uh, consumer demands are getting higher and higher and the technology is just uh, going crazy um, in terms of features. And then this is especially true in wireless devices and that includes you know, all, the, all the different variations, whether it's Bluetooth, YLAN, 5G now. Um, and with all of this advancement, uh, the need for increasing the level of EMI shielding uh, is increasing. It's both to be uh, compliant with the environment and also compliant with itself so that the components within the many, many components uh, within these devices aren't interfering with each other. And you hear the terms EMC, EMI, uh, EMC, the electromagnetic compatibility. It's, it's really the degree to which uh, the device, uh, the circuits are compatible with their environment and with the, uh, other devices in the uh, immediate area. And, and then, I, as I mentioned, uh, it's also critical that it doesn't interfere, interfere with itself. Um, and then these disturbances, these electromagnetic uh, emissions, uh, these are the EMI, the electromagnetic interference. And now, the, the method, the, I guess one of the primary methods, uh, although there's several methods that are used to, to uh, help improve EMC and reduce EMI is uh, through the use of what's called a Faraday cage. And this is uh, creating a six-sided, you know, picture a cube that's got six sides to it. So in a, a complete uh, enclosure uh, with um, conductive material to prevent these EMI emissions from going out. It basically is just blocks in all of the uh, emissions and isolates the circuits. So a board level EMI shield, uh, it really creates five of those uh, walls. And then when it attaches to the board, the ground plane of the printed circuit board uh, creates the sixth side of that uh, Faraday cage and completes it. So that's your board level EMI shielding not even 101, that's probably pre-101, but a little bit of background. Here are, let's take a look at some examples of traditional board level shields. And there's, there's many more, but this sort of encompasses uh, an overview of what's out there. And there's what I would call one piece stamped and formed metal cans. And sometimes they're perforated, uh, sometimes they're not. There's two piece uh, EMI shields and they're typically called a frame and lid. And that I would say that's primarily the what we'll be comparing against today in this discussion. 
And then there's also two pieces that have uh, some sort of clip that's attached to the board and then uh, the, a, a can that is you know, placed down on top and clipped in. And uh, looking at some of the attachment methods, uh, these cans uh, can have pins that go down through vias to the ground plane and are soldered in place. And they also can have a frame or, or in the case of a one plate, one piece can that uh, will attach and solder uh, to the surface of the printed circuit board onto um, solder pads that are then go to the ground plane, or it could be a clip also. And some of the uh, typical shortcomings of uh, these various uh, products and methods are that they consume excess board real estate and board real estate and a lot of applications is at a premium, as especially as densities continue to increase. Uh, they can make it uh, impossible or uh, at the very least difficult to inspect and properly inspect all of the components and the solder joints that are especially immediately adjacent to the, to the EMI shield and also make it difficult to rework um, and removing those shields once they're in place is also uh, a challenge. The two-piece shields are typically less rugged uh, through extreme environments. Uh, so many of uh, the applications uh, have pretty rigorous shock and vibration uh, type drop requirements. And uh, these shields have difficulties and can have challenges passing those requirements. And uh, we are talking about an EMI shield that's expected to have a certain level of performance. And these two-piece shields, uh, because of the, the nature of their design, they provide lower shielding effectiveness uh, than what's required in some cases. Again, these uh, shields are uh, constrained in terms of the design and shapes. Most of them are limited to some form of a square or rectangle and they're, they create uh, excess weight. And certainly not uh, an issue on all applications, but now with uh, certainly in anything that's wearable or handheld or in flight, uh, grams and weight uh, becomes an issue. Now, what we're here to talk about is this snapshot technology and how, like I said, how it can help overcome some of these things. And it utilizes uh, small solder spheres uh, as the attachment method for a one piece shield. So it sort of gives you the benefits and we'll talk more about these of a, of a one piece shield and the advantages of a two piece shield all in, all in one. And it's installed onto the printed circuit board when oval shapes, oval holes around the perimeter of uh, isolation cavities or circuit cavities are snapped over top of solder spheres that have been attached to the printed circuit board during the reflow process. And I'm gonna go over, that's a uh, not extremely obvious attachment method. So I have some uh, brief illustrations coming up to help explain it a little bit better. And what's, what's behind the shield itself is a, a very unique material, especially for uh, shielding. It's a actually a metallized uh, polymer. The base material is polyether imid, which goes by the trade name of Ultem, if you've heard of that. And then it's tin plated on one side of the surface. Um, and what that does, it creates that uh, conductive surface that's needed for the shielding, but it's also providing a non-conductive inner surface. And there's some benefits to that that I'll highlight as we go through this. And polyether imids, it's a, a popular, well-known um, engineer polymer and uh, very good at uh, operating temperatures up to 170 degrees C. And so each shield, it's, it's custom designed around the layout of the circuit that needs to be shielded. Uh, so this is a little bit opposite to what a traditional shield is where this, the shield, you're given a certain shield size and shape and the designer uh, works around that. 
and fits that into his design. In this case, the shield can be really thermoformed into any shape. And uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's works around your circuits versus the other way around. And now this uh, attachment mechanism. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, uh, there's holes around the perimeter that are oval size. And then there's also this uh, valley between two conductive surfaces of the, of the shield. And this uh, shield is then pressed over top of the solder sphere, making, and it snaps down to the ground plane. And here's so John, little, do you ever have uh, any of these solder spheres pop off? I would say maybe not never, uh, but they are very durably attached. And this has been established through uh, reliability testing on shock and vibration, uh, but they are very rigidly and durably attached. And how many times could you snap on and snap off? You know, uh, essentially an unlimited number of times you can remove and replace a shield. So change electronic components, remove it, and then snap it back on. Yes, and you know, you, sometimes after testing, a, a component will need to be tuned or reworked. Uh, you can remove the shield, replace it with a new shield without any additional heat steps at all. So you see here is, here is a, an illustration. You, you have the, the shield aligned over top of the solder spheres. It's pressed down. The, the shield has some flex to it, that polyether imid material. And then it snaps down in place. And this, uh, we'll talk more about it, but it, it durably holds that shield in place. And to accomplish that, there is an installation tool that comes with the design. And, you know, it's got typically alignment pins that locate it. And this ensures it's a one very, very simple one step process of putting the shield in and, and snapping it in place. The typical process flow is that uh, there's, uh, you know, solder pads are placed for the each individual solder sphere, just like they were any other component. And then the board is printed with the solder paste. Again, components and solder spheres. There's solder spheres are placed onto the solder paste in the chip shooter process, just like they're a resistor or any other component. And the board goes through reflow. Once it goes through reflow, inspect and rework, and then install the uh, shield. And what the thing to be noted here is that it is installed after reflow. And this is, I mentioned the benefits of a two-piece shield. Uh, most people will be using a two-piece shield, a frame and lid, because they need that ability to inspect after reflow. And uh, what this does, it, it creates a very open, unobstructed view for uh, inspection, whether it's automated optical inspection or visual inspection and rework. And as Aparna mentioned, the, the shield is, if necessary, you can remove the shield. It's not recommended to reuse that same shield, but uh, for the cost of a shield, it's, it's worth to just get a new shield, replace it, and again, no additional heat steps. Here's a, a real world example of what I was talking about, that ability to uh, inspect. And here's two you know, popular high-end watches, one, uh, is a customer that uses this snapshot technology on the right, and the other is using a frame and lid. And what you can see here is, uh, and firsthand from the, the customer in this case, is the really value of being able to inspect uh, all of those components and do any kind of rework that's, that's necessary. And you can see the dramatic difference. Um, it's also, you can also note that here's one of those examples where you're on the on the left you have a, a square shield frame on a round uh, circular printed circuit board 
And on the right, you can see this, the, the shield was designed to follow the contour and the shape and optimize the, the board real estate there. And talking about now, uh, you know, leading into the idea of optimizing board real estate, uh, I'm gonna show an example of uh, how the solder sphere uh, saves space over the traditional frame and lid style cans. And this is an actual solder stencil. Uh, they're not all gonna be exactly like this, but this is an actual uh, example. And we'll look at the case where there's two adjacent shields, uh, which is, uh, quite frequent. Uh, you can see the solder pads, it needs two discrete uh, solder pads with space between them to prevent any uh, potential bridging and shorting. Uh, so there's about 3.8 millimeters required there, edge to edge. And in the case of using the solder spheres, uh, the pad requires actually 0.6 millimeter and the solder sphere is uh, 0.9 millimeter. Uh, so that really defines that space that's required. Um, and now if we, we overlay that, there is a, a decent space savings uh, as, and especially in this case where there's adjacent uh, cavities. So John, we have a question here. How small can these solder spheres be? Uh, this system, the current design, is all based on a 0.9 millimeter solder sphere. Um, I can tell you, we're not, I'm not covering it here, but what's in development uh, on our end is reducing that to a 0.6 millimeter uh, diameter solder sphere. And so I would expect that to be commercialized relatively shortly. And how much clearance around the solder spheres are necessary on the board? Well, there's, there is uh, some space required for, you know, you got the shield material and it is at a slight draft angle. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it is less than what's required on um, the traditional solder pads. And that's mainly due to, you know, you're looking to avoid bridging. Uh, so, but I'm, I mean, we can definitely pull up the exact uh, clearance required, but um, I don't have that right off the top of my head. Yeah, and I noticed that in this one diagram, you've got spheres that are lined up in the middle. So you got spheres on the outside and in the middle. Yes. And why are the ones needed in the middle? Wouldn't just around the perimeter be enough? So in this case, it's isolating two cavities. So in, in uh, in other with other technologies that would be two separate shields mm -hmm. and and in this case we we can use a single row of solder spheres uh, to isolate uh, the two side by side cavities so you have two emi generating electronics yes. and then you can have a wall in yeah. your shield separating the two yeah and you see in in this case down in the bottom there's all these discrete shields that are next to each other and in this case, it's a single shield. And I'm actually, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute in greater detail. Um, I had mentioned the, the durability and ruggedness in, in harsh environments. Um, frame and lid style cans typically use some sort of dimple system and there's variations on that. Uh, but what that creates in shock and vibration is the potential for relative movement, movement between the, the frame and the lid. And this uh, A can put you out of spec or B, it could uh, change uh, at, at the very least. It can be unreliable or inconsistent performance uh, in terms of EMI shielding. And the solder joints, uh, as we, we just pointed out previously with these the solder pads, uh, these solder pads are create this rigid uh, joint between the frame or the shield and, and the, the board and they can uh, be stressed and crack in any sort of in, in vibration, shock, flexing. And with the case of using the solder sphere, there's two, uh, there's redundant uh, points of electrical and mechanical contact at each individual sphere. Uh, the system uh, is extremely lightweight. Uh, the, you know, I'll 
I'll show some data, but it's, you know, the shield is from, I think it 86% less weight than a, a metal shield. So there's lower forces that are imparted on it and it's flexible. And you can see in that picture trying to show some flex there. So it, it will flex with any, any movement and there won't be any cracking. And again, it's a one piece shield. So that, uh, performance, the EMI shielding performance remains extremely consistent and reliable through uh, changes in the environment. And this has been, you know, this, I think Aparna mentioned it in the intro, this has been, this technology has been out in the field for over 18 years. Uh, numerous really demanding applications uh, from military and industrial radios, uh, and believe it or not, some of the most demanding applications are the the scanners, handheld scanners. We see the UPS drivers and you know Amazon drivers using every day as they come to our door. Uh, those have very rigorous shock and vibration standards, um, and we've been successful in winning some of those applications just based on this the ability to perform through the drop test. I think it's three meters on every edge and every corner. Um, and again, you know, a nose kind of a missile. Uh, so it's, it is proven reliable and uh, consistent in these types of applications. Uh, now, uh, a part of what we were just talking about that side-by-side -side cavities, um, many uh, shields will will offer and, and claim a multi-cavity performance. Uh, but in, in most of those cases, I can't say all, but most of the cases, the shielding effectiveness from cavity to cavity does not equal the shielding effectiveness between the cavity and the external environment. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty obvious that the lid is not, uh, electrically sealed uh, to the frame underneath. Uh, the frame is providing a barrier and what you have there then is a, is a slot that can uh, create a, a passage for the electromagnetic waves and uh, um, crosstalk between, between the cavities. In the case of uh, using the solder sphere between the two cavities, uh, each cavity is is isolated uh, as well as it's, you know, the internal to external versus cavity to cavity is the same uh, shielding, shielding effectiveness. What that enables is, you know, in this case, you have nine individual shields were replaced with one uh, snapshot shield. And now, taking those board savings between shields and adding it up across this board results in uh, pretty significant savings. Uh, and obviously there's logistical savings and simplicity in manufacturing when you're, you know, attaching one shield versus the nine different shields. Now shielding effectiveness, I mean, we're, we're talking about shields. So how does it perform? Uh, and this is where I, I said it has the advantage of the two piece where you can two piece shield where you can inspect uh, and do rework after the reflow oven, but it also has a performance of a one piece shield where it outperforms a two piece frame and lid style uh, by 20 to 25 dBs. Uh, in this case, it's showing 500 megahertz to eight gigahertz, um, but typically it's you know within up to 12 gigahertz. Again, I, I, I covered this earlier, but it's, it's thermoformed in virtually any shape. And you can see a couple examples there. You got round, round boards, round shields, uh, makes sense. Uh, it can be irregular, it can be multi-cavity, it can be multi-height within the same shield. Uh, really, it's, it's left to the imagination, but just based on how it's manufactured, that's really uh, easy to accomplish. When you go back to that uh, nine cavity uh, or nine section board, if that was done in the traditional way, how big would that board be? 
Uh, How much space did you save here? Haven't, I haven't done that calculation. That's actually would be an interesting one to do, um, but I, I don't, I don't know. But I think it would be significant. I think so. Yeah. Pretty neat. And the weight, uh, I mentioned that look, this is comparing a, um, just a hypothetical standard rectangle uh, frame and lid. Uh, I know frame and lids are typically either 0.1 millimeter, 0.2 millimeter. This is looking, say, they take the average, but it's uh, pretty substantial uh, weight savings. Again, not certainly not every application, but uh, we are seeing more and more that do value uh, saving even, even grams. And with that 18 years of, of history, it's in really all kind, all, every industry we, you can think of, uh, it's being used and used reliably and uh, performing well. Uh, the XGR is uh, ISO certified. It's made in the USA. Uh, manufacturing is located outside of Chicago. Uh, it's ITAR registered, so it, it's a meets all the requirements for you know civilian and uh, military government applications. And with that, I that is what I have, and uh, welcome you to contact me directly. You can contact Aparna, uh, and this is the type of technology where having it seeing this but having it in your hand it really gives you a feel for um for what it's like and the uniqueness we're happy to send out samples we have just a shield that shows different geometries we've got a, a sample circuit board or sample board with a shield on it um to get a feel for the attachment method so, so john to... we have a question here um you mentioned uh military contracts, are there any rad testing data uh, for this use in space? That I would say in, for use in space, uh, in satellite applications, and I would say, you know, honestly, there is, uh, there has been concern uh, about using it in space because it's tin and there is a, in some cases that's even prohibited to have tin on the surface like that for uh, due to um, the potential for tin whiskering. Uh, but that data, I do not believe we have that uh, test data. So if there was a, a coating applied to the tin, would the tin be trapped then and not whisker? The question. Yeah. <laughs> so because of the therm, I think, I think yes, uh, because of the, our thermoforming process, we've done some work to show that it's it's basically annealed and it's not going to do that, but there just isn't a test that exists that we can prove that. Um, so I don't know, Bill, if you've got any comments on that. Yeah, the fear, the fear is with tin whiskers where tin just grows this dendritic growth in space in the vacuum. And we don't think that would happen because of the annealing process that John talked about. A conformable coating on top of it certainly could be a way to go, but we've not, because space, um, the applications are so small in terms of numbers, we've not gone down that road. It hasn't been worthwhile for the, either the, uh, the user to, use, to test it or for us to use it. But we'd certainly be willing to do that if somebody was willing to do some work and help us out there. So we've got a, another question here. Uh, they're excited about the technology. Um, can you comment on the typical percent cost delta against traditional rectangular frame EMI shields? It's, I, I can't because I've, I've seen such a, a variation um, from, you know, 20 cents for a can to, you know, $2 for a simple can. What I can say is we've typically been, we've been cost competitive, if not a, a cost advantage. And that grows with that as we replace multiple shields with a single shield. So it, it, it's the simplest case, it's it's a little, you know, it's a one inch by one inch square and you get a stamped can and it's gonna be in high volume 
10, 15 cents, 20 cents. We're not going to be competitive with that. But I will say in consumer applications that are using hundreds of thousands per year, like a, like a GPS watch, uh, that simple multi-cavity shield is less than a dollar. Um, so it really depends on the size and the volume. And you get some real estate savings as well. Yeah. Pretty, um... some, some other things that usually come up in, in that vein are what is the turnaround time? So after uh, a design is kind of finalized by the board manufacturer, the board, the person making the board, it takes us one to two weeks to create a model of the shield and then another one to two weeks to actually produce the molds and get the, get the first samples off the line. So the shortest we've done it is a little over a week when we were rushing for one customer um, from the time they handed us their design and said so we need to shield these four areas, or actually it was, I think it was nine areas. Um, so typically it's probably four weeks for that. And the cost for that is somewhere um, in the range of three to five, maybe $7,000 uh, for an NRE charge. And that includes all the design work, the making of the mold, which will work for production as well. It includes the installation tools as well as the models of the installation tools in case additional ones, those need to be made and includes 50 of the first production shields. Um, so we do get into applications where they only order 20 of these for drones per year, but we're also in the GPS watch where they order a million of them. So it just, just depends. Um, and then the cost of the product is, is commiserate kind of with the buying and, and size as John had said. So if someone had an idea of their design, they wanted to shrink it and they have all the common shielding, they can send you that and you can you know, shrink it and put your technology design in there. Yeah, we could put their, our design in there and we could show them instead of, you know, now having a millimeter of space or all around the edge, you have two and a half millimeters. So you could shrink the whole board by that two and a half millimeters kind of thing. And you, so, you design for Gerber's? Like if you, someone sent you, we just got a question about uh, Gerber files. If they send you the Gerber file, you could take that and then uh, drop your uh, solder balls, spheres in there. And create the design? We do design from Gerber's. The one thing that Gerber's I don't believe have is really the height. You know, they're two-dimensional typically. Um, so we need the height just so that we can make the contour, make the, the shield tall enough around the components. But we can certainly work from Gerber's. I just, uh, SolidWorks is what we work in natively. Um, so anything 2D, 3D modeling, it would be fine. Yeah, and that's a good, good point, a part of that. We we do that engineering and design work and the, and the layout of the spheres for, for and with the customer. It's a very um, cooperative and back and forth process. We don't give, give a guideline and say, here, put the spheres here. We, we take the drawing and we do that and then uh, ensure the clearances and the spacing is all proper. Sure. Uh, another question came up, uh, what major OEMs are in that are using these or already implemented. Uh, Which one did you talk about? <laughs> yeah, that's because you might have NDAs in place and you can't. Yeah, we typically don't get our customer names. Um, and what I can say is that we're in a top tier, multi billion dollar medical device imaging manufacturer, uh, multi billion dollar government contractors multi-billion dollar <laughs> conglomerates that are making industrial, all types of industrial devices, including industrial handhelds. Um, the one we, thing we can say, because it's a commercial product, is the Sunto watch that John, John showed a picture of. I mean, you guys can go out and buy that watch and take it apart and yeah. you'll see that it's in there. So, yeah. Excellent. Any other questions that folks have on this call? One thing we can say, you talk about, we can't really talk about who we work with from an OEM standpoint because of the, because of the NDAs, but we do work with Flextronics or Flex, Jable, Samina, uh, Benchmark, uh, John, you know, probably Plexus. Plexus, there's probably two dozen, dozen other um, contract manufacturers that we work with, all the big guys in India, in China, in Taiwan, in Singapore, in the US, in Mexico. So, you know, if you guys are outsourcing any of your stuff, um, we do that. 
Um, and there was a question there, and I think we can say it because Honeywell is one of our customers that it, it makes commercial products. We do, um, the, Honeywell does use our products, absolutely. Okay. I'm Let's not sure that- We're on the ABL list or a pre-vendor list. Yep, yep. That's I'm not big sure, sure what the next thing means, Largo specific. Is that, uh, maybe that's a location? Florida, I think. Okay. Um, so I don't know if we worked with that specific location or not, to be honest with you, but we we have at least a half dozen Honeywell locations that we worked with. So. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm out of questions. I don't have any more. I think I asked most of them while, while you were running the, the presentation. Uh, if anybody does not have any more questions, we'll have Caroline jump back on. Um, I don't know, Bill or, or John, do you have any other uh, words of wisdom or, or anything regarding this on how uh, folks should, should proceed? Just you know, give either you or me a call and we get going. Yeah, I mean, if there's any interest at all, if somebody wants something that's light waste or less space, give us a call. I mean, we'll be honest, we turn down two applications for every two that we take because we say, hey, we're just not gonna be cost competitive you don't value what we're bringing. So we're going to be honest with you in the first 10 minutes after you talk about it. Somebody came to us with a, an ice bath thing for, for, you know, winds and whatnot, and they wanted to shield their, shield their electronics in that, in that thing, an ice bath circulator. And, you know, we talked to the guy for 10 minutes and pretty quickly everybody came to the conclusion, hey, go to PhotoFab, get your 35 cent standard can, and, and we moved on. Other places, you know, we've, we've worked with people that, um, where they do see the value and, and then we can get our designer on board and, and kind of help you work through it. And if, again, if it doesn't work out, we understand. So just uh, if you see value, give us a try, give us a call. Hey, Brenda, I see a question here. Did you mention this or I missed it? The question was, do you design from Gerber's? The answer was yes, we can design from Gerber's. Um, the one thing we will need is, is I don't, Gerber's I think are usually 2D for the most part, at least, and we will need the height of the of the components so we can design the the, the height of the shield. Uh, but we can absolutely design from Gerber's. We can give you back Gerber's with the uh, solder sphere uh, or the mask solder mask layout on it in the Gerber file. So that is not a problem at all. Happy to do okay. That. Yep. Thanks, Bob, for bringing that up. Okay. All right. Oh. Well, I think we're done. Thank you very much, Caroline, for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, Perna. Thank you, John. And thank you, Bill, for answering those additional questions. Um, I encourage you to please reach out to John or Perna if you have any additional questions or to request a free sample. Um, as a reminder, this was recorded and will be posted right to YouTube channel and meetup group. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Take care. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Caroline. Thank you. Made it. Bye. Have a good day.